He's not. He's not. But he's dead, so he don't care now, brother. <laughs> Junior's not dead, though. R.C. Sproul Jr., he's taking over everything. But, but yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, all the Presbyterians that... <laughs> I do need a robe like that. That's kind of a cool thing. I just want a black one, not a white one. That's all. I'll get my white one in heaven. It'll be real. <laughs> anyway, all right. No, I like Spurgeon a lot, but I sure wouldn't have wore Calvin's uh, robe in Geneva. I would have burned Calvin's robe in Geneva. <laughs> and then ran for my life out of Geneva. <laughs> yep. So they couldn't kill him. Some of them are the reformed Calvin, the reformed group of because, see, there's Calvinist Baptists that didn't hold to those those um, because they were more Baptist than Calvinist. That's why. It is very confusing. It is very confusing. It, it's a it's a sordid history that we'll go through and we'll we'll, we'll explain as best we can. But that's why. We don't identify really with any of those groups except Baptist and Anabaptists and Waldenses and all the other. But we don't with the we're not reformers. We're not trying to we're not trying to revive Geneva, even though some of those men, even John Clark held to mild Calvinistic doctrines, but they didn't run. They didn't believe in the doctrines that of persecution and which is what we're going to talk about today a little bit right here, right now. It's it's a lot. I mean, you can't really it's kind of a. It's tough to get through to explain. There's a lot there. But we want to talk about soul liberty or freedom of conscience today, which, by the way, is not a reform doctrine. It is not a Catholic doctrine. It is a Bible-believing Baptist doctrine. That's what it is. And it's not a pagan doctrine either. That's right. It is found in the scriptures. So let's turn to some of those scriptures. Luke chapter 9. Are you ready, Luke? Are you ready for me over there? You're ducked down over there. I didn't know if you were ready. You're hiding out on me here. Luke chapter 9. We'll give you the first instance. There's two ways that we can look at this freedom of conscience or individual soul liberty, as it's called. There's actually a few different ways. There's actually probably three, but here's one. There is the doctrine of which civil magistrates should have no power to persecute those that do not agree with whatever church state is at the time. Now, that does kind of bleed into the doctrine, no pun intended, into the doctrine of uh, separation of church and state. But they all kind of, all Baptist distinctives are mingled together. They're not, you, you don't have one without the other, really, because it's all Bible, right? It all fits together. It's all like a chain uh, that, that, that comes together. Uh, uh, links in a chain that come together. Luke chapter 9, verse number 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. The Samaritans were mad because Jesus's face was going towards Jerusalem. And they didn't like that. Okay, because the Samaritans and the Israelis, well, not a really great relationship. Didn't get along well. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them. Now, I want you to notice this. What did he do? He turned and he rebuked them for that spirit. He said and said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. 
For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And what did they do? It says, and they went to another village. And they called in the guards, and they came in, and they rounded them all up, and they killed them all. No. Jesus said, it says, and they went to another village. He didn't call down fire from heaven. He told them absolutely not are you to destroy these people. That's not why I came. That's not why Jesus came. He didn't come for, for civil magistrates or for churches to destroy people, right? So the first example of this, what we can say very easily, is the first example of this is a man, God made every man to have freedom of conscience, Right. Every man was created with that freedom to worship God or not to worship God. God has no forced worship. It wouldn't be real. So freedom of conscience deals with the fact that every man is born with the right to worship God or not to. He is also born with the same... He is also born a sinner, and he is born with the fact, uh, and he must live with the fact that if he chooses not to worship God, he will die and go to hell. But God never told you to send him there early. I'm going to say that again to you. God never told you to send him there early. Right? Or gave any prince or governor the right to send them to hell early. We're not allowed to burn the heretics. We're not told to burn down the heretics. That's a different spirit. What is that spirit? It's the spirit of Rome. It's also, see, it's a Babylonian spirit. It's the same spirit that, that, uh, that they had that they, when they stoned and they killed the prophets, which were sent among them. Right? It's the same spirit that they had when they, when, when they stoned and killed Eli Elijah and the other prophets of God. That's the same spirit. Right, it's the same spirit. And it's not the spirit of Christ. It is what? Antichrist. We must always be careful to identify a persecuting spirit like that as the spirit of Antichrist. Because it's never of God. It's not. No. So that's one aspect of individual soul liberty. Now, I'm going to show you, so what does that mean? How does that relate? I'm going to read something to you that I find fascinating. I don't know how far we'll read. I mean, it's in Baptist history, and it's called Tracks on Liberty of Conscience and Persecution. And no, don't be afraid. I'm not going to read the whole book. All right? Not today anyway. But you know what? I started reading it. I, I started reading a portion of this, and I, was, I couldn't put it down. This is a letter that was written to King James. Now, we love our King James Bible, the authorized Bible, right? We love it, right? But we also understand that King James wasn't a perfect man. He actually persecuted Baptists. He threw them in prison. Well, this man, and I'm telling you what, this guy that wrote this letter to the king, he had some spiritual fortitude. Because when I, huh? Yes. Because when I read this to you, the things that he said to the king, remember, this is not like we can write the president. We can say, I think you're the biggest devil in the world. And I think you're this and that. And nothing's going to happen to us. I mean, they can't do anything to us, really. I mean, they could if they wanted to, I suppose. But generally speaking, the president is going to throw the letter in the trash and not care. Right, because his secretary or somebody else is going to read it and be like, ah, whatever. But when you wrote a letter to King James, the king, that meant something. Especially when you signed your name and you didn't use some anonymous name. You just said, this is me. Yeah, it wasn't a Facebook post. <laughs> a little different, right? 
Well, I want to read you a portion of this. And the man's name, what's his name here? It's called a plea for the liberty of conscience. This useful treatise entitled Religion's Peace, long since presented by a citizen of London to King James and the High Court of Parliament, then sitting, I allow to be printed. Wow. Now, his name was, I think it's Bushner. If I'm saying his name right. And this is how liberty of conscience works concerning governments. Now, we'll get into separation of church and state because that's the an overall thing. We'll get over that late, get into that later. And maybe I think next week I'm going to save the two offices for last. And I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit. And I'm going to finish what I'm starting today and deal with because we're dealing with liberty of conscience right now. So I'm going to finish what, what we deal with uh, with separation of church and state. Because they go together so closely that you really, it doesn't do me a whole lot of good to split them up like that. So we'll continue on next week with that. And then we'll get to the, the, the two offices at the end. I know that's out of order a little bit, but you'll be able to handle it unless you have, you know, what is that called? OCD where you put stuff, is that what that's called, Joshua, when you put stuff out of order and drives people nuts? Is that what that's called? That's you? Oh, okay. So I'm doing it on purpose, so I just want to warn you. It's order, but I'm, yeah. Is it? Ah, I see. Okay, so here we go. I want to read some of this to you, and it, and it is very impressive. Um, his writing to King James. To the high and mighty King James, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, and to the princely and right honorable parliament, Leonard Busher wishes the wisdom of Solomon, the zeal of Hosea, of Josiah and the mercy of Christ with the salvation of your spirits in the day of the Lord Jesus. So he's he's wishing a good salutation of the king, right? The Bible says to honor the king and you know pray for him. So he's he's being kind, right? Maybe a lot nicer than you and I would be, uh, g considering watching your brethren being slaughtered, right? And he is, he's right. For as much as your majesty and parliament do stand for the maintenance of the religion wherein you are born, and for the same do most zealously persecute with fire and sword, I have thought it good and also my duty, most royal sovereign, to inform your majesty and parliament thereof. In all humility, therefore, I give you to understand that no prince or people can possibly attain that one true religion of the gospel, which is acceptable to God by Jesus Christ merely by birth. Now you have to understand something. Busher is a Baptist. So he doesn't go along with all that. He doesn't go along with all that divine right of kings in, in the sense of that they're, you're just automatically born into the family. And, and he doesn't go into the christening and the, bap, the baby baptisms and all that stuff. He's a Baptist. He's going to tell you, King, I don't care what family you come from. If you ain't saved, you're going to die and go to hell. That's what he's telling the king right there, in case you haven't figured that out. That's exactly what he was saying to him. Just because you're the king don't mean you're going to heaven. Amen. That's, I mean, he, he was a preacher. You know, he's, he's, he's telling him. For Christ saith, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Also the apostle James saith, of his own will he begat us by the word of truth. And the apostle Peter saith, being born anew, not of mortal seed, but of immortal, by the word of God, who liveth and endureth forever. Now, he's probably not using the King James Bible. I don't know if he had one yet. The circulations were coming out at that time. So who knows exactly what they had at that point. Uh, it was 1614. But I'm not sure everybody had it as far as wide distribution at the time. I'm not sure when that happened. Therefore, Christ commandeth this word to be preached to all nations, that thereby they may maintain the new birth by which your majesty and parliament may perceive that the one true religion of the gospel is not attained by natural birth. For then all princes and peoples and all nations should have that one true religion of the gospel. That which you see and grant they all have not. Yet many of them also will defend their religion wherein they are born by fire and sword as if it were their natural and earthly inheritances, or had with fire and sword been, been gotten, and therefore will with fire and sword maintain and defend it. So he's saying, you're maintaining your faith by a fire and a sword. See, this is, this, this is what the reformers did. 
This is how they treated people, Baptists, especially people. This is what they did. You have to understand, this is what, and King James was of those people, you know? We don't follow the King James because of King James King James himself. We do it because it's the inspired word of God. That's why. And it was conditioned by, or it was commissioned by the king. By, where the word of the king is, there is power. We know that God ordained that. We, we know and we believe it, right? Has nothing... By the way, God uses imperfect vessels. Right. You and I are good examples of that. Amen. So understand that. Wow. Isn't that something? Yep. So that that's how you know that these people, they weren't... They weren't Baptists, but you're reading about Baptists, right? This I'm reading you. They're Baptists, <laughs> and they're telling you the differences in what they held to compared to the differences of the crown, right? Big difference. Okay, so we'll skip ahead some of this. Uh, it's all good, but we can't read it all. Therefore, may it please your majesty in parliament to understand that by fire and sword to constrain princes and peoples to receive that one true religion of the gospel is wholly against the mind and merciful law of Christ, dangerous both to king and state, a means to decrease the kingdom of Christ and a means to increase the kingdom of Antichrist. I mean, do you realize how bold that is? What he is writing to that. That is how you know he's a Baptist, the way he is writing that. Right? He just he just is. And these reasons following do manifest, the which I humbly beseech your majesty and parliament carefully to consider, and that according to the word of God, which shall judge every man according to his deeds, and persecution is a work well-pleasing to all false prophets and bishops, but it is contrary to the mind of Christ, who came not to judge and destroy men's lives, but to save them. And though some men and women believe not at the first hour, yet may they at the eleventh hour, if they be not persecuted to death before. So what was he saying? He said, King, you're killing these people. They might get saved, but you're killing them. Before, they might get saved at the eleventh hour, but you're taking their life because they don't believe like you do. you got to stop doing that. And no king nor bishop can or is able to command faith. That is the gift of God who worketh in us both to will and to do, to do of his good pleasure. Set him, not a, set him not a day, therefore, in which of his creatures hear not and believe not. You will imprison and burn him? Paul was a blasphemer and also persecutor and could not be converted by the apostles and ministers of Christ. Yet at last was received to mercy and converted in extraordinary by Christ himself, who is very pitiful and merciful and would have no man to perish, but would that all men come to repentance. But not by persecution, but by the word of reconciliation, which he hath committed to his ministers. And as kings and bishops cannot command the wind, so they cannot command faith. I'm telling you, man, that this is golden. <laughs> this stuff is good, man. It is just a blessing. And as kings and bishops cannot command the wind. And as the wind bloweth where it listeth, so is every man that is born of the Spirit. You may force men to church against their consciences, but they will believe as they did before. When they, when they come there, for God, God giveth a blessing only to his own ordinance and abhorreth Antichrist. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, I can read this. This can go across the Internet and all that kind of stuff, and that's fine. But this is not like this man writing this letter to the king and sending it, and the king is reading this letter. Do you understand that? And he just told him that what you're doing is antichrist. You may force, okay, and kings are to think that they, and kings are to think that they are men as well as kings. <laughs> Nobody talks like that to kings. Baptist preachers did. They did. 1614. Yep. Edward Whiteman. Yeah. Yeah, and he was a Baptist. 
and a godly man. And his grandson came to America. Yep. So you know the story, right? Yep. Amen. Yeah, they burned him at Smithfield, right? Right. This is in the time that heretics are being burned. Yeah. And kings are to think that they are men as well as kings, and that Christ hath ordained the same means of faith for kings with, with which he hath for subjects, and that subjects are Christ's freemen as well as king's subjects. And kings that believe are Christ's servants, even as subjects are king's servants, and both are bought with a price. Therefore, both ought not to be the servants of men in matters of faith and religion, but the king shall give a greater account at the day of judgment than their subjects. And to judge men now for religion is to judge afore the time, and also to sit in the judgment seat of Christ, to whom only it belongeth, yet not before the day appointed. How much less to kings and bishops? Therefore Christ saith, he that will not hear the church... Let him be to thee as a heathen and a publican. He saith not burn, banish, or imprison him. That is Antichrist ordinance. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Because that's a good point that is made there. Here's the point. Okay, you see how liberty of conscience deals with the, with the government, but also with the church, or with the, with the magistrate not having the power, but a church also. All the church has authority over is to discipline its members. It's final thing. When they cannot respond, when they will not respond, is to discipline them out. Okay? But do them no harm. We have no authority to do any harm. We do not lift, like, like um, Spurgeon said in one of his sermons, he said, to the knife or to the sword, with Rome's priests, but he meant that. He said, I mean them no harm physically. He meant with the word of God. He meant take the word of God. And he said it very plainly. I would do them no harm. But he said that he would, he meant the sword, the word of God. Right. And you take that sword and you fight with them. But I would not harm a hair on their head. Right. Why did he understand that? Because he was a Baptist. He understood that. I talked to a Baptist earlier this week that told me that, well, you know, that was a civil war that Zwingli, when he killed, you know, the Anabaptists. No, no, he had an edict against them, and he killed them for baptism. He said it. It was for baptism. That's why I did it. I'm going to give them their third baptism. That is, I, I don't care what war was going on. Yeah, so what if it was? You still have no right to kill them. You have no right to kill those people. That's right. Yeah, not kill them. He's going to talk about that here, too, which is interesting. Not that particular, but another one. So he says, and though a man be a heretic, yet ought not, yet ought he not to be burnt, but to be rejected after once or twice admonition, that is to cast out of the church. But as in the church of Rome, people of all sorts are by persecution forced thereinto by the bishops and ministers thereof. So it is in the church of England also. Uh-oh which showeth that the bishops and ministers of Rome and England are of one spirit in gathering people their faith and church, listen, <laughs> which is the spirit of Satan, who knoweth well that his kingdom, the false church, would greatly decay if persecution were laid down. Seeing himself cannot stand before the word of the spirit of God, much less his bishops and ministers. Therefore, he will have them for a name and show to us the word of God. But indeed, if the false interpretation and alleging of the scriptures will not help, then saith he constrain them with fire and sword. Or else if people have liberty of conscience, they will try the spirits, which of them is of God. As the apostle John teacheth, and then saith he, the prince as well as people will try all things and keep that which is good. And as the church of Rome provoketh the magistrates to persecute to death such as are excommunicated out of her, so doth the church of England provoke the magistrates to persecute to death such as she excommunicates. And as the bishops and ministers of Rome will persuade the prince and people to hear and read none but themselves, so do the bishops and ministers of England also. But the bishops and ministers of the apostolic church do persuade all men 
to prove and try the spirits whether they are of God, which they cannot do except they hear and read other men's doctrines, as well as the bishops and their ministers. Neither can they if they would so long as the bishops have power from the king and state to silence and imprison all preachers and to burn all books which teach not their doctrines. Right? Your majesty and parliament shall understand that all those that confess freely without compulsion that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord, and that he came in the flesh are to be esteemed the children of God and true Christians, seeing such as are born of God. And no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost, therefore not to be persecuted. And as Abel killed not Cain, but was killed himself, and as Isaac and Jacob did not persecute Ishmael and Esau, but were persecuted of Ishmael and Esau, who and Cain were figures of all persecutors. So the believing do not persecute the unbelieving, nor the true church the false. But the believing in the true church are as they have been most often persecuted themselves. Of whom Abel, Isaac, and Jacob were figures, whose children are all believers and freemen that stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made them free, and will not be tangled with the yoke of bondage. No, not with circumcision, much less with the discipline and doctrine of the church of Rome, whose bishops are able ministers of the fire and sword, both to prince and people, as many histories do lamentably witness to their utter infamy and overthrow. Also, if the believing should persecute the unbelieving to death, who should remain alive? Then none but the believing should live in the world, and the unbelieving should die in their unbelief, and so perish forever. The Lord will not that the believing should live to the destruction of the unbelieving, but under their conversion, edification, and salvation. And by persecuting of, of prince and people to death, because they will not hear and believe, if no gaining of souls unto God, but unto the devil. And whereas ignorant and wicked bishops may think to win souls by killing prince and people for religion, they are deceived greatly, for thereby they lose many souls, and their own, and the unbelieving. Their own they lose because they willfully break the Lord's command that saith thou shalt not kill, meaning such as are not corporal male factors. So you ask me the question, do I believe these men that killed Baptists like that and drowned them for their faith in Jesus Christ and believers' baptism? Do I believe those people were Christians? I answer no. I do not believe that Ulrich Zwingli was a Christian. I believe that he was a lost man. I believe that he was a murderer and he had not eternal life dwelling in him. And he was never sorry for what he had done. And no Christian could put to death other men for their faith and believe that they and believe that they were right with God. But the Bible does say there was a class of men that would do that, that they think that they do with God's service. But they are the children of Antichrist. So when people lift up some of those reformers that say that said that it was okay to murder, and they wouldn't call it murder. They would call they have the right of the civil magistrate to take the sword and to kill non-believers. But they can show nowhere in the scriptures where that right is given. Nowhere. But they did it anyway. Why? Because they had murder in their hearts. Right? That's what they had in their hearts. So I have no problem saying I do not believe that Ulrich Zwingli and men of the like were Christians. No, I do not believe that. Why? Because they were murderers, that's why. Right, and no repentance. Yep. That's right. And that's the same spirit. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It all I'm telling you, it is. And they got it from Rome. That's why they had it. And that's why those poor Waldensians and those other people, they never harmed a soul. They never, they never hurt anyone. They never hurt them for what they believed. And, they, and you were able to dwell. Why, why do you think that Rhode Island was the first place that there was a Jewish synagogue in America? Why? Because... They believed in religious liberty, freedom of conscience. They believed that those people could be wrong, and they thought, well, I'm going to evangelize them. Sure, let them in. We'll just preach to them. Right? I'm not going to kill them. I'm going to preach to them. Right. Exactly. I like this other argument. 
I could read the whole thing to you, but we don't have time. I, I want to. I don't want to keep you too late, but man, it's good though. All right, I got to read this part. And the bishops should know that error and heresy cannot be killed by the fire and sword, but by the word and the spirit of God. These are the only weapons of Christ bishops and ministers and such only Christ ministers whose lives and conversations are so harmless, holy, and gentle that thereby and by their deaths and suffering they win souls unto God. Whereby they are known from all false bishops and ministers who like wolves and bears, not like sheep and lambs, make prey and devour both prince and people and are not of their kind if they be able to master them. They said they're murderers. Besides, may it please your majesty in parliament to understand that the believing man that hath an unbelieving wife and the believing woman that hath an unbelieving husband cannot live together as the scripture teacheth for the salvation of the unbelieving if they be persecuted to death. He's like, so if your wife is not saved, if the unbelieving is not saved, I mean, you're supposed to kill her? Well, that's what they were doing. They, weren't ki they, they were killing people. Because they were unbelievers. Right? Indeed, some thereby are forced to confess with the mouth that they, what the, which they believe not in heart, and so are made true dissemblers instead of true Christians, whereby many men are, and women are deceived with dissembling husbands and wives, as well as the king and state are deceived with dissembling servants and subjects. But the word of God, if permission of conscience might be granted, would procure upright, pure, and unfeigned husbands and wives, servants and subjects, so, they neither, so thereby neither prince nor people should be deceived. For all good shepherds will divide and separate and not force, slay, and persecute. For if men and women be found heretics, they shall be separated from the church. But if they be unbelievers, they shall not be joined unto it until they be converted by the word of God, much less forced. Which conversion for aught we know may be at their death, if not a force, seeing the Lord call some at the eleventh hour as well as the first, and not as the king's and bishop's pleasures. Kings and magistrates are to rule temporal affairs by the swords of their temporal kingdoms. And bishops and ministers are to rule spiritual affairs by the word of and the Spirit of God, the sword of Christ's spiritual kingdom, and not, not to intermeddle one with another's authority, office, and function. And it is a great shame for the bishops and ministers not to be able to rule in their church without the assistance of the king and the magistrate. Yea, it is a good, listen to this. Yea, it is a great sign they are none of Christ's bishops and ministers. If they were, they would not be afraid nor ashamed of their faith, nor yet would they persuade pe princes and people to persecute and force one another to believe them, but would use only the assistance of God's word and spirit and therewith suffer their faith and doctrine to be examined, proved, and disputed both by word and writing. So he lays it out very plainly. I, I want you to listen to this part about Muhammad's law. He says, I read that the Bishop of Rome would have constrained a Turkish emperor to the Christian faith, unto whom the emperor answered, I believe that Christ was an excellent prophet, but he did never, as so far as I understand, command that men should, with the power of weapons, be constrained to believe his law, and verily I also do force no man to believe Muhammad's law. Ouch. Did you hear that? He is a Turkish emperor. Mm -hmm. So that means he's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And he said, and the bishop of Rome tried to constrain him to be a Christian. He said, well, I don't remember Christ ever doing that. I believe Christ was a great prophet. He didn't believe Christ was God. And that man died and went to hell if he didn't, if he didn't get saved. But what he's saying is that I don't remember Christ ever forcing anyone to believe that upon death. And he said, I don't force anybody to believe Muhammad's law upon death. I said that this week, and somebody told me, oh, I didn't know you were pro-Muslim. No, I said I'm pro-life. I don't want anybody to die. I don't want to kill somebody for what they believe. Right? I don't want to kill them for what they believe. No, you can't. He said, also, I read that Jews, Christians, and Turks are tolerated in Constantinople and yet are peaceable, though so contrary the one to the other. There were places before Rome got in there, there were places that all three could dwell together. And no, they didn't all believe and they didn't all agree and they had their separate churches, but they didn't kill each other. They were safe in those territories and they didn't murder each other. And they gave them what? 
They gave them liberty of conscience. They said, you know what? Okay, fine. You're going to believe that, but we're going to ble- we're going to believe the Bible, and we're not going to persecute you for what you believe. Think about that. If this be so, how much more ought Christians not to force one another to religion? And how? And he put this in bold, by the way. He said, and how much more ought Christians to tolerate Christians when as the Turks do tolerate them? Shall we be less merciful than the Turks? Or shall we learn the Turks to persecute Christians? It is not only unmerciful, but unnatural and abominable, yea, monstrous for one Christian to vex and destroy another for difference in questions of religion. And though tares have overgrown the wheat, yet Christ will have them let alone till harvest, lest while you go about to pluck up the tares, you pluck up also the wheat. As your predecessors have done. See, I'm going to stop because we can keep reading this. I'm going to get to some scripture here and then we'll be done for the day. But you see the point here. The point is this. The heretic will be judged at the end. But you know what? You know what the, the Protestant reformers do? They take the wheat and the tares and they make that the church. But what did Christ say the field was? The world. He didn't say it was the church. He said it was the world. They say it's the church. See the difference? Yeah. So they take the sword and they kill. Now, that's one side of individual soul liberty. But there's another side to it. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. So Baptists have historically, as you see there, always been against persecuting people for what they believe. We give people liberty. Now, there are consequences to you exercising liberty, right? If someone was believing something heretical in the church and they would not repent of it, then what would have to happen if they wouldn't, if it was a damnable heresy? They would be disciplined after admonition and they would be disciplined out. They still, we still can't do anything to them. We don't want to hurt them. But what happens to them? They take their liberty of conscience, and we, we let them go, and God deals with them, okay? But we don't put them to death. We don't harm them. Do you realize that's only a Baptist distinctive? Do you understand that you're sitting, listen to me, I don't know if I can get you to grasp the understanding of this, because you live in a 250-year bubble. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know what I mean when I say that? You live in a bubble of 250 years where because of Baptist people that God used, you don't have to worry about that. If your baby isn't baptized, you don't have to worry about that. Do you realize this is the only place in the world where that was the truth? And because of the United, because of the Declaration of Independence, because of the the, the Bill of Rights that that recognized our God-given rights from God, the freedom of conscience, not from government, The Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights especially, is a noose around the neck of government. It is not to be, it it has nothing to do with it giving us anything. It is a noose around their neck that says, you can't do this to those people, to your people. It's not a noose around us. It constrains nothing for us. It is to constrain government. Like Brother Beller used to say, You have to chain and starve the beast. If government had very little to eat and was starved, we would have a better country in that sense. That's right. The Leland Madison Memorial. Those two men are the only reason why. I mean, among others that fought, but those two were the Madison or Leland was the main proponent of that, that went and fought for that constantly. He never gave up on it. And he petitioned James Madison. He was going to run for office. He would have he would have kicked out. Madison would not have won office because John Leland was so popular in Orange County. He was so popular over there that there was no chance anyone was going to beat him. And he was going to run against him. He was going to run for a Bill of Rights. And he was not going to ratify that Constitution. He, they, they said, nope, we're not doing it. And they wouldn't have had it. You ought to visit the Leland Madison Memorial if you're ever there. It's 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 a good place. It's a neat place, Virginia. Yep, yep. Um, 
Okay, and then obviously you can't forget about either the 40 in prison Baptist pastors. They are up there. They're, I, I have their books up there. Uh, their biographies of those men. They were in the fight too. Virginia was a hotbed. It is now again, isn't it? It's becoming it again, that area is. No. Well, right. Most of it goes back to uh, England. It goes back to the anonymous prisoner of Newgate. It goes back to um, the Magna Carta. A, a lot of those things that were going on around that time that were, that was happening. The people pushing for liberty. Right. They were pushing for liberty. But it's the Baptists that championed it because they were the ones that were burned. Valentine Whiteman. Paul, that was his grandson, I believe, wasn't it? Valentine was the one. That was his grandson, I believe, uh, that came to America. Anyway, so those men fought. And the, you wouldn't have what you do today if it wasn't – like you wouldn't have that Bill of Rights like that. that, that it wouldn't be there. And it influenced the entire world. Right, and they don't realize that this is a 250-year bubble. No other time in history was it like that. It wasn't. Right, and the reason it's in there is because of what happened. See, the first, I mean, you know the story. Go back and listen to the one I did on Rhode Island versus Geneva. <laughs> listen to that one. That one's on YouTube. You remember that one? We did that here live, and I and then we, we uploaded it. But that's dealing with Geneva versus, I showed all the differences in what Calvin did in Geneva versus Rhode Island. And the differences in John John, or not Leland, did I say Leland? I meant, uh, or John Calvin in Geneva and John Clark in Rhode Island. The difference is there. That was the first government that allowed freedom of conscience, Rhode Island. In fact, the Rhode Island Charter stayed in effect a hundred years or so after Rhode Island was found. After the Constitution was ratified, they kept their original charter. The lively experiment, that's right. They kept it. So this all goes back to that. But it is a bap it is a Baptist doctrine. What's that? There was a city that the Paulicians lived in and they had a temporary stay of toleration there for a while. Yeah, I've got it on, in my study. Yeah, to priests. That's I think you're right. And that, but it wasn't it wasn't like Rhode Island. Yeah, it wasn't like Rhode Island. Rhode Island's charter was unheard of at the time. It was just absolutely amazing. And it was done because of Obadiah Holmes being beaten. But anyway, you know that story. Uh, let's go to uh, Romans chapter 14, and I want to show you in the church how that kind of plays out. Uh, freedom of conscience. And we'll, we'll finish it up kind of next week. We'll look into this a little bit here. <laughs> Romans 14. So he talks about him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despiseth him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. 
Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, doth he, not, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So this context is in the local church. There's going to be things that, you know what? You may have people here in this church that they may have some slight differences in a few things. You know what I mean? We're going to have some differences. You have the liberty to have those differences. But we shouldn't use those differences as battle axes against each other and turn them into fights because that's when my liberty intrudes on somebody else forcefully it's not my liberty anymore it's a lack of charity so we ought to be careful uh explain things talk about things you know communicate our differences there's nothing wrong with that but using it as a bully pulpit or using it as something for instance i'll give you a perfect example of that doctrine uh post-trib versus pre-trib to me, that is one of those issues. It doesn't bother me. I'm post-trib. I have been for a while, but it doesn't bother me if somebody's pre-trib. I it's not, it doesn't bother me. Okay? I don't think it's I've never called people to believe in pre-trib heresy. I hate when people treat people like that. I hate it when they get into that argument and they they have this either side, I hate to do that. However, one thing that you will hear me fight over and argue about is I absolutely 100% hate replacement theology. I hate, I, I hate the fact of replacing Israel with, with some spiritual Israel and saying that that's the, that I don't believe in replacement theology. I believe there's a little return to the Israel of a people. I believe there's a literal Israel. I believe that God's going to redeem those folks by the same gospel I got saved by. One day, God's going to have a remnant after the other ones are are dead, the remaining one, God's going to have a remnant. He does have a remnant now. And I believe those, and when the Bible says all, and so shall all Israel be saved, I believe that. And I don't like the doctrine that teaches any differently because I don't see that in the scriptures. Absolutely, I do. No, I absolutely disagree with the theocracy. It's wrong. It's not Baptist. So that's why I don't believe in putting homosexuals to death. I don't believe in putting people to death that are wrong. I believe if you harm another person, I believe you're put to death. You know, like that. I mean, if it's a murder. I believe the state has the authority. I didn't say you and I have the authority. The state has the authority. God gave it to the governments of the world in Genesis chapter 9, I believe it is. Um, in Noah. What's that? Sheddeth a man's blood, so shall his blood be shed. Uh, so shall his blood be shed, shed, for in the image of God made he man. Right, so there is a judgment upon that uh, for shedding blood. Government has a moral responsibility to put to death murderers. They don't hold up to their end of the bargain because they let women stand in line and murder their babies. Is that too real? Or is that just true? It's just true. You know, we really ought to be careful about about talking about Syria and other countries, uh, about how they well they're they're gassing their own people and they're doing all this. Well, well, we're we're murdering our own babies here, and we legalized it, and it, and it, we not only legalized it, we put it in a pretty package and made it sound nice, and finance it, and pay people or pay for it to be done, don't we? And then our then our Republican government okay all right i know i know i know i know but but i gotta say it i have to say it because it's election year and i have to do my election year coverage so so here's my election year coverage for you are you ready here it is here's election year coverage okay now they're all gonna start banging the drum about abortion because it's election year and they're going to act like they really care and both sides are going to. Meanwhile, they've been funding Planned Parenthood. 
the whole time since Donald Trump's been president. They're still funded. And and, and meanwhile, the, the other thing that they're all still doing that they haven't changed at all is fully funding th- that the Republicans never put up a bill against Planned Parenthood with their bills. They did it. They do it all the time while they're in the minority because they know it's never going to pass. But when they get the majority, they never do it. They have the Supreme Court. They have the they can have the Senate. They can have the presidency. They can have the House and they don't do one thing. They only know that if you're a Republican and you're a Christian and somebody goes abortion, you're going to like go, well, okay, I'll vote for you because you're against abortion. But really, how pro-life are they? No, it's made to fund and make money. The pro-life movement is all about money. That's all it is. That's just the truth. It's a platform to get elected, and they only talk. And then they put up this bill the other day for late-term abortion. Well, wait, you guys just had the House. You had the House last session, and you had the presidency. Why didn't you pass it then? And you had the Senate. But they didn't put it up then, did they? It's just like the whole thing of Obamacare. When when, when 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 the House was in the minority, right? When they did, when they were in the minority, they put up literally, put up like a hundred times, a vo- uh, to put down Obamacare, a vote against Obamacare. When they became the majority, never put it up once. Th- Trump said, "Give me a bill, I'll sign it. Give it to me, I'll sign it." They didn't do it once. How come they didn't put the same bill up they put in Obama's face eighty times? Why didn't they do that? Because it's all a charade. That's why. Okay. There. All right, I'm done. I'm done. That was your that was your election year coverage. Yeah. yeah. And their progeny right after them, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's not the forty. It's not only the fifty million that we put to death. It's the numbers from those fifty million after that, right? Yeah. So now we need immigrants from Haiti to come in to fill jobs because we don't have any. Right. Right. Yep. They all work together. They all have the same spirit. Helena Blavatsky, all of them hated children all the way down. And then what we do, we hired all the all the doctors and brought them over here, all the scientists, and we just put it in our own culture. They were preaching eugenics here in America with evolution. That's what they were preaching. They were already teaching it here. Yeah. Doctrine matters all the way back. Science matters, right? The truth of it, it matters. It's a pattern. And you know what? We know that it's not. We know that what they're doing is not real. Uh, Anyway, but so it does. So civil government does have a, a duty in some areas. But okay, for none of us live it to himself. But how for the church? How does it matter for us that we're going to have minor differences on doctrines? Now, I'll tell you one thing, one thing with liberty of conscience. If you find yourself in a church that you say, well, I, I disagree with more than I agree with, then you're in the wrong church. Right. Or you're wrong. <laughs> and you should see if you're wrong, right? But we're always going to have slight differences. That's called people. And that's called liberty of conscience. You have the right to have some of those. There are going to be some differences. We just shouldn't use it against one another. Right. We shouldn't use it to destroy unity. Because there is much more that we agree on. And those are the strengths, the doctrine of Christ. I can put up with a lot of disagreements from people. When you start messing with the doctrine of Christ, that's where that's something that those are damnable heresies. Other slight differences in things, love and charity. Right. I'm not saying doctrine doesn't matter. All doctrine is important. But the doctrine of Christ, he was, the Bible is very specific on. Very specific on. 
Because who Christ is, is the difference between heaven and hell. Do you understand that? You might be wrong about some things, other things, but being wrong about who Christ is and damnable heresies concerning the Godhead and everything else, we don't wish you any harm, but you wouldn't be here. You see what I mean? Right. But we wouldn't harm you, and we'd pray for you to be re be restored, but but we have to we have to hold the truth. Amen? Because in the church, it works this way. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So every, then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So what he's saying is matters of dietary. Everybody in this room, they're gonna uh, people are going to disagree on food. That should never be a point of contention with God's people. It, it should never be. Everybody's going to be different. We're all going to be different. We're all going to agree with different things. That doesn't mean you can't tell people what you believe. But we all ought to love one another that if somebody tells you something you don't like or you don't agree with, you ought to love them anyway. doesn't matter. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter, does it? Does it? It shouldn't. Not above other things. Not above the important things. Right? We're all going to. And that doesn't mean you can't share what you believe either. It means that we're all going to be mature. And we're going to love each other and say, you know what? Well, it's interesting. I don't have to see like, oh, you're wrong. I'll t I might tell you wrong anyway, but but <laughs> that, does, that doesn't mean you have to believe me or agree with me, especially when it's things that they're not, they're not concerning the doctrine of Christ. They're not concerning damnable heresies. That's right. That's where you have to be careful. But concerning meats. You know, concerning dietary things, concerning some things in your life, right? Right. Right. If you really want a Christmas tree, I mean, a bail bush. Hey, that sermon really got me in trouble, man. I, I lost a lot of friends after the bail bush sermon. Yeah. But you know what? I mean, I'm. If somebody out there celebrates Christmas, I'm not going to tell them you're not saved. I'm not going to be like, you're not a Christian. You know what? Because there was a lot of years I did too, right? I don't agree with it, and I, I can show you why, but I ain't going to hate on you for it, right? There's We got we to gotta be mature about some things. Doesn't mean we agree with them, right? It doesn't mean we have to either, but we can still love one another. That's what we can do, right? Doesn't mean we're going to compromise what we believe either. But we're going to be kind. That's the difference. Right? Wow. Well, he has a way to influence him. He keeps yeah, preaching yeah. to him. You know what I mean? You know what? I I would think they would get tired of me banging that drum cuz I guarantee you I'd keep banging it, but <laughs> but they but you know what? But I wouldn't be mean to them either cuz I ain't going to be able to influence them. That's right. And that's what we do. That's the difference in liberty of conscience. That's a Baptist distinctive. <laughs> it just is that we don't treat That's right. That's what you know it always happens that way. That's what'll happen with all of us. That's what'll happen. Right, and they have the liberty to do that too as well. We also have, but see, with that liberty of conscience comes personal responsibility. It comes personal responsibility. Because not only do you have the liberty, but you also have the responsibility. It, it goes both ways, right? So I have a responsibility that goes with that. That is way different than what I might imagine in that sense. Um, let's see here. 
I think what I'm going to do is probably stop right now. And I'll pick it up next week with the other. I think I'm not done with Liberty of Conscience yet. So I'm just going to have part two next week of this. And we'll continue on with this because there's more I want to show you about it. I want to talk to you about personal responsibility. I want to talk to you about how that all plays out and a few other things. And I think I can take the time to do that. If it's not next week, it'll be the week after. Now, remember, a few things before we close here. You can go. You can shut that recording off if you would, Lou. Uh, we don't we don't need this part on there or anything. But um, um a few things to remember coming up here this month. Uh, let's see. I can't believe it's already 7 o'clock, man. If Lee would have quit eight, eating like an hour and a half ago, we'd have been able to be done. But, man, he just kept eating. He just didn't stop. Anyway, but that's your meat, Lee, so I shouldn't judge you in your meat. So. Amen. We ate like kings, didn't we? Yeah. Amen. All right. All right. So I want to remind you of a few things. Pastor Hoggard is coming. Um, he will be here on the 22nd. We'll be getting a hotel room for him here. And then 